All righty then. Well, you mentioned this earlier in the program. And boy, I, I mean, I don't know whether it was a blessing or a curse that this girls match came after Soraya and Britt Baker. But boy, did Jamie Hayter and Tony Storm show them up. And I got to be honest, as soon as this came on, I said, oh, f***ing hell, it's two and a half hours into this rotten pay-per-view, plus another hour if you watch the pre-show, and we've still got more left. And I wandered off on it for a, a while because I was like, what the f***? And then I came back and they're tearing the house down. Yep. And the people love Jamie Hayter because they've decided, like the acclaimed, like FTR, like Wardlow, that they're going to cheer for somebody that's halfway good at what they're fucking doing instead of what they're being told to do. And they have decided Jamie and Tony Storm, honestly, both these girls are better than Soraya. And they may be giving old Britt Baker a little run for her money. And they had a match that the people wanted to see. And they also had, and then Britt Baker came out and she would got more reaction running in on this match than she did having the match against the big new signee superstar. And finally, Tony Storm hits the exposed turnbuckle after nailing Baker off the apron. And Jamie Hayter wins one, two, three, and they loved it. And right then, Tony Khan had to be sitting at the fucking gorilla position, looking at the monitor, going, my God, how much did I just spend for Soraya? <laughs> and this girl was already on the roster. Yeah, and she's organically, like you've said, grown into something of a phenomenon, and they would be really dumb if they didn't capitalize on this. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the obvious thing to do is break her away from Brit and have her become kind of the baby face of the situation. People want to cheer for her. I would say, and I think I told you this before we started, but I would call this the best match on the card. Yeah. And that's that's not a knock on, you know, I thought it, with MJF and Moxley, you know, obviously that's the main event. And the story being told there, I thought was compelling. But for the match itself, bell to bell, for me, this was the best match on the card. And, See, and, it was, well, and, and and you're right. The thing is, the best match on the card can not necessarily always be the main event or blah, right. blah, 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 but can be viewed as the match that showed both people to their best uh, exposure and got the point that was supposed to be gotten across across. That's the best match. It can be. I, I remember years ago when I did an interview with Vince for, for the magazine, for WWF magazine. And he was very much against the idea that you just mentioned. He was not, I don't know if you ever got this impression from him, but he specifically brought up with WrestleMania three, I guess this had been sticking in his craw for about th <laughs> 25 years, but he hated the fact that everybody talks about Steamboat and Savage being the best match on the show because he, he said to me that because of the story strictly based on who drew the money and what was the biggest story that Hogan and Andre has got to be the best match on the show because that and 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 in his view i guess he thought anytime you have an undercard match that steals the show that that's something that shouldn't be happening which which i guess i don't know i that was his view but well if, if, see now vince i think is a little bit far on the other side of this thing yeah because that way everybody knew going in that hogan and andre was going to be just Fugly, just fucking ugly as far as a wrestling match, but that was what sold the tickets and drew the money and the two iconic personalities. But underneath, you want to give them good matches because the rest of the show, the people have been thrilled, they're excited, they come, and then they see the big main event that they paid to see, and everybody was happy when Hogan hit the leg drop. But if they had had, if every match on the card had been worse in the ring than Hogan and Andre and they weren't matches with those iconic personalities and they weren't matches that people actually paid to see and drew the money and they were also worse than Hogan and my God then that would have been an abysmal <laughs> show he he seemed to hate the idea of judging matches like the whole star ratings and all that like he he even mentioned it specifically he hated the idea of divorcing a match 
from the storyline and the angle. Like to him, it was all about the storyline and the angle, and that's what made the match special. And he just hated the idea of judging a match like you would a performance, at least for the fans to do that. It's yeah. One thing well, that you, you know, he just didn't like that idea at all. But I, I, again, that's what some people do, but that's not what I do because if the match is, you've got to have great matches on your show. They don't all have to be great because some of them, like Hogan and Andre, couldn't possibly be great, but they'll also sell tickets. But if you have all crummy matches, with interesting people, sooner or later they'll quit selling tickets because your shows are the shits. And if you have all great matches with people that the fans don't give a fuck about, then you're going to quit selling tickets even quicker because then it's like with AEW, you're, you're just seeing, even if they're great matches, you're seeing a steady barrage of the same shit with a bunch of people you don't know or care about. It all has to work together. And not every match on the card. That's what Eddie Graham used to do. He would give them good wrestling underneath and a lot of clean wrestling underneath so that the main events, when they got wild or they got bloody or they had the personalities or they had the angles, it would not only stand out even more, but it would make an impact that you remembered going home. So you can't just have great matches. You can't just have rotten matches with stars in them. You have to have a mixture of everything up and down the card. And you can't go too far again. Let's talk about the next match because, again, what you've you just mentioned, Jamie Hayter is probably going to turn on Britt Baker and become a big baby face because people like her. Well, imagine if when she did that, people hadn't already seen five turns in the last month. It might register a little more. That's what I'm talking about is this steady onslaught of what they call great matches. And even Uncle Dave Meltzer, after he's lost his mind, he's rating all this shit. The girls get five stars, better than Flair and Steamboat, because it's a new era. It, they call them great matches over and over. What you're doing is you're just doing every goddamn thing that can be done over and over to numb and immune the people to any reaction of it. So there has to be context and some element of restraint sometimes. And you have to be more focused on the personalities of the individual wrestlers than just what moves they're going to do. And then you get more mileage out of all of this. And it's also, it's more about, it's more than the moves. It's, it's even just how people carry themselves in the ring how they move around the ring. Like, like yeah. that was one of the little things that I loved about the hater and storm match. And it's one of those, like I said before, where it stands out from everything else you're seeing is I'm sitting there going, and especially nothing against Tony storm, but especially with Jamie hater. And I'm going, she is moving around the ring like a wrestler. Somebody taught her how to really, I don't know. Well, I can't articulate it as well as I'd like to, but just how to have the presence of a wrestler in a ring. And it's as simple as that. That can go a long way to getting the fans invested in a match. 